All right. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, first off, just wanted to share that we are going to be recording this webinar. Um, so um, that's no problem for the participants. I believe only the panelists and moderators um, will be on screen and um, with the with the audio on. Um, if anyone has questions and answer, please feel free to put them in the question and answer section um, and not the chat, just so we can decipher what is questions and answers and what's comments. Um, also, um, yeah, actually, I think that's it. Question and answers there and then the chat, and we're going to be answering the questions at the end. So if you can save that until then so that we can get through the program, that will be great. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to kick it over to our lovely moderator, Quilla, who will be leading us through today's conversation. I'll kick it over to you, yeah. Quilla. Yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. I am Quilla. I use she, her pronouns, and I will be moderating this panel today. I am a youth advocate with JLC, and I was previously incarcerated as a youth in Philly, and I've gone through the foster care system. I've been to many different um, youth facilities and placements, and I believe in this office and the need for it. I've co-written an op-ed and I gave my testimony in support of this office. So I'm happy to be here and moderate today. Um, so on our panel today, we have, of course, the Office of the Youth Unbuzz Person, including the Youth Unbuzz Person, Ms. Tracy Johnson, and an Associate Youth Unbuzz Person, and um, Kira Sharon and an associate from, um, no, no, no. Um, we also have a Nahi, um, JLC Youth Advocacy Fellow, Donna Cooper, the Executive um, Director of Children First, and Maura McGurney, Legal Director of Education Law Center. So thank you all so much for joining us today. So my first question, um, for those who may not know, um, Ms. Tracy, can you give a brief overview of what the Office of the Youth Numbers person is and share more about the work you all do? Yes, Quilla, thank you for asking. So as you all may know, the OIO was created via the mayor's executive order in November of 2023, um, and that was done by former Mayor Jim Kenney. Um, and I just want to give much credit to everyone on this call, JLC, ELC, Children's First, because it was you all who raised your voices and exposed the rampant abuses that were in current, that was a current emplacement and, you know, called for things like the Youth Residential Placement Task Force, right? Championed the bill that was introduced by former council member Gim and our current council president, Kenyatta Johnson, you know, and in the end, called, you know, was a part of the executive order being signed and getting the appropriation, the budget for the office. Like that was all you, you guys' work. And so major thank you to all of you for that. But the our office, we serve as an alternative access point so that young people, families, members of the public, anyone who has any safety um, concerns about youth and their well-being while they're in placement, they can file those complaints with our office. And while we do not independently investigate, we provide an additional layer of oversight. And so we receive the complaint and we review it. We look out for any 3,800 regulation violations, any violations of law or policy protocol, and we write an inquiry and we send it to the appropriate agency. So if it's, a, if it's an issue at a child welfare or juvenile justice, justice placement, we send that to DHS. If it's an issue at a behavioral health placement, we send that to DBHIDS, the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities. And we, we say, hey, we've heard about this allegation. We want you to conduct an investigation and we wanna be allowed in to oversee that process so that we can make sure that a timely, thorough and fair investigation takes place and a fair resolution is reached in accordance with the facts, the law, the policies, right? Because we're an impartial body. So we're just here to make sure an actual investigation takes place. Um, and once like, once that closes, the investigation is over, we write a final evaluation report where we uh, reflect back what we noticed occurred throughout the investigation. Um, and if we see 
things that needs improvement, we'll make recommendations. Um, and we send those reports to the leadership within the agencies. And we also, you know, compile those findings and we make recommendations to the mayor, which we are supposed to do under the executive order about what we think should happen, should, should be happening to keep young people safe in placement. Um, and that's something we look forward to doing with uh, Mayor Parker's administration. Um, so that that's just a brief overview of who we are and what we do. And we'll be talking some more about that. But thanks for your question, Nahi. I mean, Twilo. Yes. So as Ms. Tracy said, the Office of the yeah. Youth Ombuds Person was created in November of 2023 after former Mayor Jim Kenney signed the office in to executive order. And as many of you know, the creation of this office came as a recommendation that was in the Youth Residential Placement Task Force report and through tirelessly um, advocacy of a lot of folks here today. So let's start the conversation off by talking about how we got here and what led the need for an office like the Youth Unbused Person. Um, and could we have a Nahi start us off, please? Hey, y'all. Um, so back in 2017, me and myself, uh, well, myself and other members of the Youth Advocacy Program felt the need to create a publication talking about the harsh conditions of placements that were that we had experienced. That is how the um I'm sorry, hold on. Sorry. So um yes, back in 2017, uh the youth advocacy group decided to uh you know uh talk about like the harsh conditions that we had experienced um inside of uh placements. So broken bridges Broken Bridges publication was created to share the harsh conditions we were we were exposed to. The Broken Bridges publication helped la launch a citywide task force to investigate facilities. Some of the issues we discussed were about abuse in facilities by the staff, the use of the use of restraints, educational re disruption, strip searches, and the trauma of being separated from family as a child. As young people with experience in these systems, my colleagues in the Youth Advocacy Program and myself testified in April 2021 to explain why an office of the ombudsman person is long overdue in Philadelphia. We knew all too well the unsafe situations that have continued while kids have been under DHS care. We know all too well the unsafe situations that have continued while kids have been under DHS care. So many horrific situations took place under the suspension of facilities under DHS. Tragedies like the killing of our friend David Hess at Forsworth Academy, a place where many other where many others were also put at risk. Tragedies experienced by those harmed the harmed at Glen Mills and Devrox while grievances after grievances from youth were ignored. We want the independent oversight of other congregate care facilities. Thank you, Anahi. Ms. Mora. Thanks so much, and thanks for everybody being on the call today. Uh, the Education Law Center over many years had handled a lot of individual matters on behalf of students and residential placements. As Anahi mentioned, Devereaux, Wordsworth, Vision Quest, Glenn Mills, um, all of those places. So we were handling these individual matters and filing systemic complaints on behalf of children in residential placements who were not receiving an education or who were students with disabilities and didn't receive a free appropriate public education. They didn't get school stability and they had a lot of challenges re-entering school as well. In December of 2018, we published a report called Unsafe and Uneducated, along with Children's Rights Incorporated. And in that uh, particular publication, we walked through what the legal landscape is, and we underscored the lack of monitoring and oversight of private academic schools that were predominantly the schools that children in residential placements attend. 
and the state doesn't do much of an investigation and there is no oversight or monitoring in many ways of those facilities. The Pennsylvania Department of Education actually monitors only with regard to students with disabilities and only once every six years. And in that report, we underscored some of the data that is really troubling on, in, in accordance with regional studies where research has been done. Less than half of children earn high school credits while in residential placements. Fewer than 25% of youth with learning disabilities were receiving special education services while in placement. 9% of children were earning GEDs or a high school diploma, and only 2% enrolling in post-secondary education. Now, those are based on regional studies, but we were seeing in our surveys the same kind of information, and we included some of that survey information um, in Pennsylvania as well. So it was with that backdrop that we became very involved in this uh, issue, and we were also members of the task force that made a recommendation, and we supported the, the creation of the Office of Youth Ombudsperson. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Mora, and thank you all for sharing those insights into why this office was created. As was discussed, the advocacy to create this office began back in 2018, and we are here now in 2024. So this question is for Ms. Donna, Ms. Mora, and Anahi. Where would you all say things stand now in terms of the state of our young people in placement? What are some current advocacy efforts or issue concerns? Um, Anahi, could you start us off, please? Can you repeat the question again, please, Colleen? Yeah. So I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking, like, where would you all say things stand now in terms of the state of our young people in placement? Um, and what are some advocacy efforts or issues of concern? Um, so... A few weeks ago, um, I had traveled with the Juvenile Law Center and a staff and youth advocacy program members to Harrisburg to talk with the legislators about the importance of passing House Bill 1381, which is the Juvenile Justice Omnibus Reform Bill that will help reduce the number of young people inside of these suits. Um, so some of the, uh, one of the bills that I had talked about with one of the staff persons I had talked about ending fines and fees. I had talked about how, um, you know, like we be charging, well, yeah, we be charging teenagers, you know, to pay like high amounts of money and, you know, we can't afford that. Some of us be what, 10, 11, 13, and they be wanting us to pay like a high amount of money. And how do we do that? Um, you know, we, we rely on them to actually pay that and they can't, the family can't, you know, the family can't pay that. And that's just like, you know, you, did, you technically are just opening the doors for youth to be deeper involved with the system. You know, once they don't pay, you know, you have to come at, you know, you have to come back inside the placement and like, you know, like situations like that. Um, uh, we also talked about ending direct file. Um, another one we we um we talked about some of our experiences inside of placement. We had talked about our educational um experiences and you know a, a lot of other stuff. Um advocacy efforts right now should be focused on investigating and community investing in communities and putting more city dollars into building new facilities. Um, staff and program members are also uh, working to introduce legislation supporting an independent office of the child advocate in PA. We need responsive oversight of facilities across the entire state and as many opportunities for youth and families to file grievances when they are experiencing harm. So with the... Um, Office of the Child Advocate. Um, it will be kind of like similar to them, but my person we wanted it to be on its own, like not without DHS or like any other um any other facility. You know, uh, 
looking over what they're doing. We wanted it to be, you know, to be able to do their investigation without any ha without having to worry about, you know, DHS being involved and, you know, stuff like that. When I hey, Ms. Mora. Thanks so much. I think um, there have been some changes. There are a number of facilities that have closed. Glenn Mills would be an example of that. Um, there are fewer children that are going to residential placements um, in some of the statistics. Our concern is that what we have created in some ways is that there are other places that children are going to where we don't think they should be placed. They're spending too much time in detention centers. We have overcrowding the, at the PJJSC and we have uh, children staying there for extended length of time. Um, we still have uh, facilities that are not being re regulated. There's no oversight, there's no monitoring on the education side of things. Um, and what we're seeing in the most recent months is that there's a trend towards students staying longer um, in residential placements, which exposes them to trauma, to abuse, and to deprivation of education that they often cannot recover from. Um, on the positive side, there has been um, some changes at the state level with regard to education. One is that uh, there's a pen link, which I can put in the chat, which was issued about the importance of school stability and that children in residential placements have that right. It needs to be enforced. There should not be bundling of services that children are required to go to the on-ground school rather than having access to the public school. So that was a positive. There is a new office created within the Pennsylvania Department of Education of Program Monitoring and Accountability. Um, there is a child advocate at the state level on the education side that is looking into these issues and, and looking, obviously, the Office of Youth Ombudsperson in Philadelphia is a wonderful change and something that we welcome. But we are still seeing the same pattern of children being in residential placements where they're often on virtual learning, their education is disrupted. In the PJJSC context, we recently filed last month a complaint with the Pennsylvania Department of Education on behalf of students with disabilities. 50% of the children there are children with disabilities who are failing to receive the services that they need. And they're staying there for extended periods of time. And in some cases, those children, there isn't a reason for them to be there. They're actually just awaiting a placement. Um, so the, the those issues continue. We've been involved in supporting legislation at the state level that would ensure more monitoring on the education issues. And I'll put that legislation into the chat. And I think others are um, going to highlight that issue as well and what's going on in the juvenile justice side. So thank you. Um, I wanted to recognize that Kate Fox from Children First has joined us. Um, Kate, are you planning to, to, to share with us today? Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. I am here for the mental health piece. Awesome. I know Great. Donna's here also. Awesome. Thank you. I just wanted to also share before we move on to the next question, Quilla, um, that there is um, uh, an office of the child advocate at the state level um, that, that there's a bill going around about that. And so um, that's to build some extra level of uh, oversight at the state level. Um, and um, I think, you know, we should all keep our eyes on that as well. And we can drop information about that bill in the chat for you all, for anyone who's interested. Um, but we can move on to the next um, question now, Quilla. Thank you. Great. So this next question is for um, the office. Um, what has your case volume been like and um, what what are some of the rights violations that you have seen so far? Great, thank you, Quilla. I can answer that one for us. Um, so, so far we have sent about 14 official inquiries to the city agencies since the office was first opened. We've also fielded a number of referrals for um, concerns that are not within our scope of work. So out of county concerns um, or issues that are arising in like in foster homes rather than group homes. And the number of cases that we have worked on each quarter has been increasing as we kind of grow as an office and as we get our name out there and be, people become more aware of what we're doing. 
Um, we have been on at least one site visit for almost every case, which has included all three types of facilities within our scope of work. So foster care group homes, juvenile detention facilities and placements, and psychiatric residential treatment facilities. Um, some of our weightier cases have focused on systemic issues at facilities, um, and we're seeing things ranging from improper use of restraints and isolation, issues with personal items, um, medical care concerns, uh, as well as education issues. And we have also handled some cases that are like systemic and affect multiple youth, as well as some cases that may be affecting one youth. Um, so we've been tracking everything that comes through our office, including issues that we open cases for, as well as the problems that we have to refer else to. And we also track all service concerns and issues that are reported to us by the city agencies. So pretty soon we're going to start putting on our programming within facilities, and that will include doing Know Your Rights presentations to the youth, surveying the youth, um, and more. And then we're going to be able to track and compile all of this data over time and hopefully share these findings more largely with everyone in our next annual report. Um, also for now, like we're seeing a lot more complaints coming in from parents, staff members, and trusted adults. But as we start our programming, we do expect to receive more um, facilities directly from them from the youth themselves. So we also expect the number of cases that we take on to increase substantially once we start doing that facility programming um, and youth have easier access to file grievances with us directly. So that's where our caseload stands right now, and we are very much expecting it to grow as we start to enter these facilities. Thanks, Kara. So speaking to improving the safety and quality of youth residential treatment facilities, Ms. Tracy, can you speak to um, what your office has been doing on this and how can people make the best use of your office? Yeah. And so, good. yeah. So we've been working to immediately follow up with with the agencies once we get a complaint come through our office. Um, and one of the main things we wanted to do is like actually like develop what our um, interdepartmental protocols will be. And so making sure that we have a way to follow up with um, to follow up with. Um, agencies about the complaints that we're receiving and have an understanding about what's that flow of information going to look like? How are we going to do data sharing? How are we going to work on cases together? And so that was really important so that we can have, you know, a memorialized um, document that helps us figure out how we're going to work on these cases. Um, and that's been really important. We've been working on that with both DHS and DBHIDS. Um, and we've been working to get out things that have already been created. So the, the youth rights guides that the task force created, we share the family rights guide with all of the parents who come to our office. We share the youth rights guides with the young people. Whenever we go and speak about our office, we make sure to carry those guides and get that information out there because young people and families knowing their rights is, is what's most important. Um, and as Kara said, you know, our volume has been over a dozen, so not the highest, but we know that once we get into the facilities and start putting on our programmings, doing our Know Your Rights trainings, our surveys, being on the spot right there in front of young people if they want to file grievances, that's going to really drive an uptick in our cases. And we know we're going to be seeing a lot at that point. Um, and I know anecdotally, like what we're hearing from complainants and people who have come to our office is that they're seeing an increase in communication and just a, a better flow of of communication when we get involved in their cases. And so that is effective for us because as an impartial body, our main job here is to make sure that the young people and the families who are accessing the services that this city provides to them, making sure that that's happening in a way um, that's fair and accessible to, to um, Philadelphians. Um, and we 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 just work on we we work up our cases, we make sure it's systematized. And again, we do not independently um investigate allegations, but we do do that oversight and that evaluation and make recommendations to the mayor and to the public to make sure our young people are safe. And so we, we've been doing that from the very beginning and we look forward to um doing even more in the year to come. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. We also 
wanted to open the floor up to our partners on the call to discuss um, more improving the safety and quality of the placements, um, reducing the use of placements, and implementing effective aftercare. So now that Ms. Tracy has talked all about the Office of Youth Ombuds um, roles, what are some issues that everyone else sees as the most immediate concerns and how can we address them? I think the most important thing I want to underscore is that we don't want children going to residential placements. We want them to stay in the same environment, community. We know it's really traumatic. We know that it places them at risk. Um, so I think that's really important to highlight that we want to ensure that children can stay in their community and in their home school. So having resources in schools where we increase the accessibility to mental health um, services, where we ensure that children are receiving the support that they need in school is critically important. We also want to ensure that um, there are school-based diversion programs so that children are, you know, are often being referred out of school into these residential placements that whereby the judges are making that decision. So we want to increase that uh, the availability of school-based diversion programs. That's part of the legislation package that I think others will be talking about. Um, we want to stem the school to prison pipeline, obviously working on that. But for children who do end up in residential placements, there has to be more accountability and monitoring. And the state legislation that's been proposed that's passed through the House Judiciary Committee is one way to ensure that level of, of accountability. And we continue to work with the Pennsylvania Department of Education to address this issue as well. And I will throw it over to... Um, another panelist, or I'll leave it to the monitor. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Mora. Um, I want to ask Ms. Kate, are you able to share? Thank you. Hi, yes. Hi, I'm Kate Fox from Children First. I lead our mental health policy work, and I agree with what um, Ms. Mora just spoke about. I want to I say that you know, I think if our, our mental health system is not set. We we wait until youth rise to the level of needing the child welfare system or the juvenile justice system to get services. And it's not set up in the way that you can go see someone if you're just not feeling great or if something happens to you instead of acting out or, or exhibiting behaviors in schools you and waiting to get the services, crying out to get the services that you need. So we're in Chet Children First working on a set of reforms in the mental health system that would help kids to never rise to the need of getting um, involved, child welfare involvement or juvenile justice involvement. Um, those reforms are, are spelled out in a memo that I'll put a link in the chat to, but it's really what, about what Mara was talking about. So expanding access to supports in school. So to end that school to prison pipeline, making sure that students, all students, are um, supported in the classroom in prevention instead of just get, getting the clinical services. Um, we're also talking about um, removing the, the clinical diagnosis. Like right now, to get a mental health service, you need to be evaluated by a mental health professional and get a diagnosis which can label you and follow you for the whole rest of your life. Instead, we're proposing for the state to allow for mental health services. If you have, if you're involved with juvenile justice or child welfare, we know that kids in this population are at risk for mental health challenges. So they can receive those services without rising to the level of clinical diagnosis. Uh, we're also talk, we're also asking the state to expand who's able to deliver services so that we can expand the mental health workforce to reflect the population that they're serving, have more culturally relevant and diverse uh, adults serving children in the mental health system. Um, and finally, we're also asking for, again, a lot of this work to be centered in schools so that kids can be receiving services where they're at. Um, I will put a link to our out, the outline of what I just said. I just said a lot in a little bit of time, outline in the memo um, in the chat, and then I'm happy to also provide my contact information too to talk further about mental health issues with the participants. Thank you. 
Yes, that is great. Thank you, Ms. Kate. Um, Anahi, would you like to share? Yes, thank you, Paula. So um, our biggest concern is separating children from their homes and communities. And instead of, instead of sending children to harmful facilities that are expensive to the taxpayers and not making their community safer, once children leave these facilities, they face educational barriers, their disruption from their home schools to placement schools put them behind, and they have a difficult journey getting back on track to get their diploma. As these young as, as these youths transition into adulthood, they are also struggling to get stable housing. To address these concerns, we need to fund and expand and prioritize the use of prevention, diversion, and community-based services. Youth need a safe way to file a grievance in a facility and need as many opportunities as possible to file a, gr a grievance. We are working on a second broken bridges that covers not only the harsh conditions that we're still seeing in juvenile juvenile placements, but are also highlighting the experiences of program members who were in other congregate care settings like group homes. Thank you. Thank you, Anahi. Can we get Kara or Ms. Tracy? Okay. I was actually gonna say if we can give Donna a chance to um, introduce herself, and I know she wanted to talk about some of the state advocacy stuff. So Donna, if you wanna take that away and then Quilla, we can hop right back in with your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I just want to say having Tracy run in the office of Youth Ombudsperson is spectacular. And it's a collective victory for everybody that's on this panel and listening that we have some added protection for children from Philadelphia and residential facilities. So kudos to getting the office set up and being there, Tracy. Um, having listened to the call, and my apologies for you all not knowing I was here, I'm in Bucks County right now, and the storm really took out the Wi-Fi, um, but I have been listening, and I wanted to just point out that there's a couple um, instructive lessons from forming the Office of Youth Ombudsman that can contribute to our success at the state and city level on advocacy. When the office was formed, it was a coalition effort of a lot of people on this panel and who are participants today. To say to city council, first, we need to evaluate why kids are going into residential facilities and identify specific things we can do to reduce that number. Mara went through many of them and to protect them when they were safe. And we held incredible hearings where youth testified from the Juvenile Law Center and from Delaware County and where people from across the country came and talked about the importance of having an ombudsperson where they could be kept safe. And what it shows is that when we work together, we can get city council and the executive branch, the mayor's office to listen. And as a result, the executive order was passed and the appropriation was put in city council. Now it wasn't easy, but right now city council can do something this year that would keep this work going. And so as you know, fewer kids have been sent to detention in the last several years as a result of all this great work. And, as, and money is being saved by the city as a result of doing so. And the district attorney's office and the controller's office estimate that there's about $4 million that could be available for diversion programs if those funds were being liberated from the line item for detention and moved into diversion. And so we wanna encourage you to reach out to us if you would like to be part of the effort to talk to city council to make sure that we put more pre-detention and post-detention diversion services in place for Philly kids and encourage city council members to move that money. Now we'll put stuff in the chat and we'll send it out afterwards, but this is right now. We have about eight weeks to affect this conversation. City council's reviewing the budgets now, and we encourage you to talk to your council people about that. Use any money that's not be, that's being saved as a result of reduced placement and put it in diversion. Very simple message. Let's move that. Second thing at the state level, there is legislation that's been referenced in this call, House Bill 1381, and that bill would reduce the, can the chance that a kid is being sent to detention or that a kid is being sent to placement. And we have to get behind that bill. Now look, Philly delegation members are really important to this. Many of you know that the 
appropriations chairs from Philly and the Speaker of the House is from Philly and many great senators are from Philly and they are supporting this measure, but they're not on board with 100% of it yet. And so we really need the voices of the people on this call to say, we need to do everything we can to raise the age by when a child can be charged with a crime. It's 10, it's gotta go to 13. That's even too low, but let's get there. We gotta stop sentencing kids as adults, right? So that both of those changes are gonna decrease the number of kids who ever end up in a facility. And then we need to get the counties to do a better job investing in diversion. That's the essence of what this bill does. And it really forces the courts and the counties to invest in our kids and keep them out of residential facilities. So if you are interested in being part of the effort to push for 1381 at the state, Children First is the convener of a coalition. You can join that coalition. We'll put Stephanie Arbatina's email in the chat. Join that coalition if you're a grassroots group, if you're an individual, if you're an organization. All the other groups here who are presenting today are part of that. We need you part of that. And then finally, if you are a parent or a child that's here today and you want to lend your voice to this, let anybody on this call know because we need to involve you in talking with the Parker administration, we need to involve you in talking with city council, and we need to involve you in talking with the state. There's a lot of work to do, and we really need you to be part of that. All right, and I can just and jump in with a final thought. Thank you, Quilla. Um, so even though we as an office have a scope of work in regard to what cases we can open inquiries into, we also really want to be thought partners in reducing the use and improving the quality of these placements. So we do publish issue briefs on our website about some of these problems. Um, the OIO recently published an issue brief on aftercare, which highlights some improvements that can be made across systems to ensure that youth are receiving adequate aftercare during their transitions within the systems and then also their transitions out of the systems. So that's on our website. If anyone would like to check out our recommendations, we also hope to have a second part of this issue brief series up on our website by the end of the month that will focus on improving the quality and safety of residential placements. And then the third and final part of that issue brief series will focus on reducing the use. So that will hopefully be up around summertime. Um, so we definitely wanna be thought partners in this work with you all. Thanks, Kara. And Ms. Tracy, this final question is for you. Um, is there anything you would like to share about the future goals of this office? For sure. I want to say that we are um, working now to schedule our first um, uh, programming opportunity within a facility. And so we're hoping to have that on the books um, at the end of this month. And we're really looking forward to getting in there, doing our Know Your Rights trainings, doing the surveys, um, allowing young people to file grievances on the spot and collaborate, continuing to collaborate with the agencies to say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is what we um, are hearing. Let's all work together to follow up. And once we get to gather all of that information, as well as, you know, look at the data that we're seeing from the agencies, from our surveys, from our complaints, we're looking forward to being able to compile all of those findings and, and share more trends about service concerns of what we're seeing and a larger annual report that we want to produce later this year, maybe sometime in the fall. Um, because this year in review kind of really showed folks about what building this office was like. And in the annual report, we can dig more into, you know, what we're seeing, what our young people are saying, and maybe able to share some early findings from the surveys. Um, so we're really looking forward to getting underway with that work. We've kicked off our um no youth rights training. So we're, we're not only are we doing trainings for young people within facilities, but we're also um, training um, people who are interested in knowing about young people's rights. So we did a great one with a, with a support center for child advocates. And they were, and I know some of you folks are on the call, you all were phenomenal. And we, we were able to have a great back and forth with them. Um, so we're looking forward to doing these trainings for, you know, social workers, paralegals, attorneys, anybody who's working with young people and families who are in congregate care, because word of mouth is how, you know, folks get to know more about who we are and make best use of our, um, 
have our office. Um, we're going to continue to, you know, share with you all on our social media. So make sure to follow us on our Instagram and our Twitter, um, uh, follow our website. Uh, and, and if you want to file a complaint with our office, oh, feel free to call us, email us. But we do have an online complaint form on our website. And we just want to make sure that people know about that. But um, and we want to table events. So if you all have events, invite us to come. We'd love to be in community, talking to young people, talking to community members, talking to families. And so we're really excited about being more outward facing. We took this first year to really get our house in order internally, to get our operating, our case operating procedures down. Um, I think we have that published on our website um, to really have our internal infrastructure solid so that no matter what, when when something comes to us, we have a plan for you know what's going to happen with it. But now that we've done that internal work, we're really excited about the external work, getting into communities, getting getting more into the facilities, and um, partnering with folks like you all more so. So uh, we're just really ecstatic about all of that. And stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um. So yeah, I'll turn it back to you, Quilla. Yes, thanks, Ms. Tracy. So now we just want to take a moment to invite you all to come off mute and on screen if you wish, um, just to either ask some questions or to share some updates about what's been happening with your work. Um, I saw in the chat someone said, how are we going to address the lack of permanency resources available for youth in congregate care? Um, What's really important, um, uh, one aspect of permanency is reunification to allow young folks the opportunity to be reunified with their biological family and um, if and parents and kinship. And one of the things that we we like to do is it's it's within the rights for young people to be able to stay in communication with their families, to be able to keep that bond um, so that they can return safely um, to their families if that is an option. Um, but another thing, if if that is not an option, of course, you know, young people do deserve um, permanent oppor opportunities to have family. So whether that is adoption and not constantly going back and forth between foster care homes, um, I think um, also a part of permanency is having some stability, right? So thinking about um, independent living opportunities that will allow young people to you know, live in safe, habitable homes, um, and and build and build that um, foundation and independence for themselves. So I think that there's a lot of different options, and I know we're really interested in working with different people um, in Philadelphia to make sure young people um, in congregate care have those opportunities. So thank you for that question because it's a very important one. Tracy, could I just comment on one thing about that? I will say I really appreciate the question on permanency. And I think that as a county, we can be doing more to do exactly what Tracy just said. And I would, um, you know, I, if you would like to follow up with us, we have begun to raise these questions with Philly DHS to really think about how we increase the permanency rate whether it's reunification or independence or adoption. And um, we could be doing a better job and we need to have more people asking that same question. So please reach out to Stephanie Arbatina on our staff. I put her name in the chat. Um, I, I don't wanna say we're going in the wrong direction, but I, I do wanna say we could be doing a lot better. And I think we need to really encourage Philly DHS to think about how it deploys resources in this regard. Can I just add one quick thing to that, just to underscore a statistic that probably a lot of people know, but only 2% of cases are about uh, abuse, physical abuse or sexual abuse. So that means that the remainder in the dependency system in Philadelphia are about neglect, which is often about living in poverty. So we need to really, you know, have a sh paradigm shift here about how we are taking children out of their homes. We have one of the highest rates in the country, and we really need to be looking at that because that's where we start to undermine that relationship with family, where we're not in contact with family and community, especially if um, in the juvenile justice system, when, when kids are 
placed very far away from home and in some cases in Texas right now. So we really need to think about how we are looking at both systems and um, really their impact on our children and youth. Thanks. Uh, Tracy, one other thing I wanted to mention about that, if you don't mind, um, when Kate Fox went over the mental health reforms that we think are really critical, sometimes permanency is um, inhibited by mental health challenges of the child or their, their family. And in general, so is our juvenile justice rates. They are accelerated by mental health challenges. And so um, being really clear that to promote permanency and reduce um, JJ system involvement, our child welfare system has to be more forward and leaning in to connecting mental health resources for the, the uh, child's family and the child. And so we've often thought of these as two different systems. There's the mental health system, there's the child welfare system. And sometimes they've worked together and sometimes they haven't. And that really has to be able to be a massive like mindset change that collectively we bring to both the juvenile justice and the child welfare system. Thank you, uh, Mara and Donna. Um, I just realized that because we are in webinar format, the attendees cannot raise, cannot come off mute. But if you raise your hand, oh, I think that you can be able to share. So if any of our attendees want to raise their hand and offer a comment or a question, I think us panelists will be able to answer you. Lisa, Lisa Varen. Hi, JC. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, you can see me? You can't see me. We nope. can't see you, but okay. we can hear you. Well, I'm here. Um, it's wonderful to virtually see everybody and to be part of this conversation. Um, I was about to send Stephanie a side email, but thought it might just be relevant to share with the whole group um, to the point about pre-arrest diversion. A lot of the work um, my colleague Faith, who's on the call, and, and folks of us in the city have been working on um, to create the Juvenile Assessment Center involves some police pre-arrest diversion. And I just wanted to put out there that there are some coordinated efforts to expand that. Um, and so to the extent that you all are putting forth advocacy efforts towards the air quotes city, please um, reach out. I'll put my name in the chat so we can make sure that we're pushing kind of best practices from across the spectrum. And I'll also just mention that um, as of next Thursday, it will be official with a press release, but the city was awarded a $450,000 planning grant, a continuum of care OJJDP grant to talk to help coordinate all the systems and identify all those gaps and create a new implementation plan. We do have Juvenile Law Center um, folks written into it to provide some focus group opportunity and Philadelphia Family Voices, but we do want to make sure the advocacy community is kind of represented and that we're informed um, from all the angles. So uh, we, there'll be more to come on that, but um, hey, Kathy, <laughs> we're very excited you guys are involved. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, as folks um, in the advocacy community of which I formerly felt a part of and still feel a part of, it's really important that us at the city have all your brilliance and um, best practices to push ahead. So thank you very much. Thanks for sharing, Lisa. And we uh, thanks for um, hosting us yesterday on the tour. Uh, we appreciate it being able to talk with you and, faith and see the facility in person. to see the space in person. I see Mar Maria Pantras, Mar okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Hi folks, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but not see you like Lisa. Oh, great, all good. Um, so um, my question is about advocacy with the court. So first of all, uh, my name is Maria Kandras. I'm the chief of staff for council member Gaudier. Um, we've been working with a, a lot of you on um, juvenile justice issues because PJJSC is in our district. Um, so we feel a responsibility for the young people who are going there. Um, so that's sort of what kind of jump started our work um, and it's expanded since then. Um, so today there's a DHS hearing and the council members asking lots of questions that you all have shared with us 
um, about um, the Juvenile Justice Center and sort of the investments they're making. Um, so feel free to, to follow up with me after the fact. But that said, um, a, a question we're having trouble um, wrapping our minds around is the fact that a lot of these initiatives eventually run into the courts and what the courts choose to do and what the judges choose to do. So do you all have thoughts, ideas, suggestions on how to do advocacy with the courts? Like, for instance, like, you know, is there a way to provide resources to the judges so that they... Um, have a better understanding of the, you know, capabilities of different diversion programs and are more likely to um, utilize those? Is there a way to make sure that, and just like track the outcomes or sort of hold judges or the courts accountable for any like bad decisions or misdeeds happening in that system? It's just something we really struggle with because they don't, they aren't responsive to us as council. Um, so we don't have good ideas on that front. So I could jump in a little bit, Maria. Um, and I totally agree with you um, that, you know, it's a relatively unaccountable branch of government that is a critical player in this system. And um, I will offer two things and I'm sure uh, others will as well. One is that I think you hit the nail on the head, which is judges, proclaim or claim, whether it is accurate or not, that they do not have enough knowledge about the existing resources that are available and confidence in them to use them. And so creating greater confidence and information is a strategy that might be useful. And we were recently talking with DHS about putting some materials together specifically in that regard that would enable like substantive briefings for the courts on what is available. However, I also think your second point about them being un unaccountable is, you know, fundamentally our problem because we, even if we give them knowledge, it doesn't mean that they will act on it. And I, I would um, sort of welcome anybody's idea, anybody's leadership to uh, begin to assemble resources for some kind of court accountability project. We ran at Children First for years, a, a very small court accountability project. And uh, it had some modest impact, meaning the system, even small things can get the system to the courts to respond. Um, but I would say that there's a real dearth of anybody sort of stepping forward to do that work. And we certainly don't have the resources to do it, but we'd love to share our experience with somebody who could. So, you know, it, it's really needed. I'd say that um, we're interested in doing um, some no youth rights trainings with um, judges um, uh, just so they can know more about what uh, rights young people have in placement and that we can show it, share more with them about what we're hearing and what we're seeing. I also think that that has to be a concerted effort, right? So it's the courts, but it's also probation. It's also, you know, the defenders, the DAs, it's, it's all of the players together, like collectively having a conversation. Because I think that that makes it easier for us to identify like what's actually happening and do like some real time myth busting about, oh, this is what we're seeing or that's what we're seeing. Um, but yeah, I know that we're, you know, at the OIL, we're interested in doing our um, trainings with uh, with the courts as well. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, as Lisa Varon talked about, they have the Juvenile Assessment Center in there. I, we've seen a tour. We saw that they have the polycam set up. So there's opportunity for the courts and the probation to be in that space and meet with families and young people in real time and learn more that way. There's tons of opportunities. Um, so we just have to keep pushing forward. But great question. I would just wanted to add to what people have said that it's important that courts do have access to this information. The juvenile court rules give them wide latitude to make these decisions, for example, but there are some important protections. The juvenile court rules, for example, on the education side, require judges to consider the educational impact on the child at every stage of the adjudicatory process in the dependency rules and in the the rules that govern de the delinquency proceeding. So that's something that needs to be enforced. There is a way to take an expedited specialized appeal if a child is going to a residential setting. A recent Pennsylvania Supreme Court case just handed down maybe last week, the NEM case, 
re underscored that um, that a judge has to make specific findings as to why the child is being placed in a re in that residential facility. In that case, it was a detention center. The court made no findings, and then the appellate court just rubber stamped it. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, "You can't do that. It is as of right, and findings need to be made, and it needs to be appealed." So. Finding those opportunities for appeal to make that good law to ensure that there are parameters is important. The dependency bench book is a place that judges look. So we provide resources explaining why it is not a good idea. I know Juvenile Law Center does a lot on this, explaining why it's a bad idea to place a child in a residential placement. What are the consequences of that? So I think that providing that information is critically important, using the tools that we have that are available and looking for support from others in that context. But we've got to really make our laws more prescriptive so that judges don't have these options. Thanks. I know we're about to come to time. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, the resources are in the chat. We, for the OIO, for our resources, we'll um, make sure to email them out in our thank you. But um, I wanted to invite folks. Did anyone else have any final things to say? Of course, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Quilla and Anahi, thank you both so much for you know sharing your experiences with us, for moderating and speaking. To Donna, Kate, Mara, thank you all so much. You just hopped right in there when I made the ask to do this with me. Um, so thank you for championing this office and continuing to be huge supporters um, to my team, Kara, Ajane, and Gabi. You know, you guys make everything run every day. So thank you. Um, it's it's yeah, it's our one year anniversary, and we wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here with you all talking about the things that are most important to us which is our young people the narrative around them is getting scary these days and we really appreciate you all sticking in there holding true to what we know which is that young people deserve all of the love and the care that we can give them and we cannot throw them away so thank you all so much we really really appreciate you all thank you tracy and your team for the incredible work you do we are so so grateful thank you